Welcome to Train Time, the podcast from the Train Campaign. You'll hear from leaders around the country about different passenger rail projects, because we're convinced that passenger rail is the essential framework for efficient, sustainable transportation in the 21st century. Train Time is hosted by Karen Christensen, who founded the Train Campaign. Me, boys. The be choo-choo. Support for Train Time is provided by the Transportation for Massachusetts Coalition, which includes more than 100 organizations advocating for clean, equitable, smart transportation solutions. From sidewalks and bike lanes to intercity rail, T4MA is leading the conversation on how we can build a truly modern transportation system. Learn more at t4ma.org. Hello, I'm Karen Christensen, host of Train Time. Today we're talking to Ben Heckscher, founder of Trains in the Valley. Ben is a key figure in the Western Massachusetts Rail Revival, and this conversation is long overdue. Ben has been working on infrastructure issues for much longer than I, and I've learned a great deal from him. Today, we'll be hearing about how he first got involved in rail in New York City, and then carried on that work in the Pioneer Valley. This is a pivotal time for infrastructure, and especially for passenger rail in the United States. Ben has plenty of ideas about what should come next and how to get there. Good morning, Ben. It's great to talk to you today. Good morning, Karen. Tell us about how you got into rail. This is a question that always comes up because it's not a most common obsession. I wouldn't I wouldn't call it so much an obsession as an interest. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked for a number of years uh, in Frankfurt, Germany um, and lived there. And the rail network, as most people know in Europe, is much more extensive than the United States. Um, and I used it to get around uh, either locally on the tram network or uh, on the regional network or even on the uh, pan-European network um, because it's just it's such a dense and interesting network. It's, it became my primary means of traveling <clears throat> any kind of a distance. Um, so when I came back to the United States, I became sort of more interested and focused on, well, why is it that sort of we can't have at least a little bit of what they have in Europe. Um, mm-hmm. So when I moved to Western Mass, uh, where we had have where we have almost no rail network, um, they were just beginning to do a, let me back up and fix that. Um, they were just starting to uh, redevelop and reconstruct a rail line that ran through basically from Springfield to the Vermont border known as the Connecticut River line. And I was watching what was happening and I started to ask questions and look for information. Um, And then one thing led to another. And then uh, I met another gentleman named Sam Lamelski, and we started a group called Trains in the Valley to focus on rail uh, in the Pioneer Valley region of Western Mass. And in before that, you lived in New York, I think. You certainly wrote about New York. That's so right. There, there you were writing rather than actually organizing. Is that right? That's right. When I, when I lived in New York, um, I lived uh, one block of, off of 2nd Avenue. And I just returned from Germany. And they were just starting to break ground on phase one of the 2nd Avenue subway project. Um, and I became curious as to what was going on. And I went out and started taking some pictures and and then I had a you know a pile of pictures in my computer and a friend of mine said, What are you gonna do with all the pictures? And I said, Oh, I don't know, maybe I'll put them in an album. He said, No, no, I said, Don't put them in an album, make a blog. This mm-hmm. was you gotta remember this was back in back in two thousand six, two thousand seven. Um and then I did create a blog called The Launch Box about the second of you subway, which sort of morphed into a uh uh citizen reporters effort to sort of document what was going on where I could and uh, report on what was happening in my local neighborhood and, and, and follow the construction as best I could. Which took how many years? Well, that uh, just the construction part of that took about nine years. Uh-huh. Uh, there was probably 10 years or more just in planning for that phase of the project. 
Mm -hmm. And you're, I think you've told me that you're, you have some family roots in, in trains. My grandfather on my father's side uh, spent his career working for uh, a Philadelphia based company known as the Bud Company. Uh, and the Bud Company, for people who don't know, it was a uh, historically a company that built uh, stainless steel rail passenger cars, which were used extensively in the in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s in the United States, and still are used today. The uh, Amtrak, uh, excluding the, the higher speed Acela service, are Bud cars. Uh, bud coaches that were built in the uh, Red Lion plant in Philadelphia, which is no more because bud, uh -huh. bud went out of business years ago. Oh, I didn't even know that they were still in use. I know that there's some that are being restored and some at museums. So we're actually riding on bud cars sometimes. I like to ask guests on train time when they first rode a train or what their first memories of riding a train. My first memory of riding a train is probably, um, I don't know when I was, probably five or six. And we lived in a small town outside Philadelphia called Swarthmore. And we would take, we took what was called the Media Local, which was a commuter line, or still is a commuter line, uh, into Philadelphia to go to the John Wanamaker store uh, to visit and see Santa Claus. <laughs> so we got to have a train ride into Philadelphia to have something to eat and, and then see Santa and then take the train home, which I thought was great. <laughs> that is, Obviously a, that is a really good first memory of riding a train. So now we're going to come to Western Massachusetts. And I, I know that a, a lot of people who listen to this won't really have, be able to imagine what, Western Massachusetts is, or when you say trains in the valley, they'll say what valley. So can you paint a picture of, of where, where you are now? And you're, of course, uh, you and I are in different locations. Tell people about the Pioneer Valley. Can you paint a picture, please, of the Pioneer Valley? What is that valley? What is it like? Something about its history so that, so that we have context for the developments that we're going to be discussing. So the, the, the Pioneer Valley is a, a term uh, that refers to the three counties that are in, uh, in the eastern part of Western Mass. That might not make a lot of sense, but <laughs> there's four counties in Western Mass. Um, the far western county is known as Berkshire County. Um, and that's the county that you're in, Karen. And it runs basically from the Connecticut border all the way north to the Vermont border, uh, and that's Berkshire County. But just to the east of that are three counties running south to north called Hamden County, Hampshire County, and Franklin County. And when you put those together in a group, they're colloquially called the Pioneer Valley. Um, I don't know the, really the history of it, um, but that's just what it is. So that's sort of what our focus has been because the rail line that runs north to south through this valley uh, historically, it's been called the Connecticut River Line for obvious reasons. It follows basically the Connecticut River mm -hmm. uh, and it runs, it crosses the border down in uh, uh, Longmeadow, Massachusetts, crosses the state line, I should say, uh, runs up to Springfield, then follows the Connecticut River up through Holyoke, Northampton, Greenfield, and then it sort of exits the state into Vermont uh, through East Northfield. Mm -hmm. So that's the north south line that is really the focus of what uh, the rail advocacy group trains the valley looks after. Mm -hmm. And what's the situation on that line now? And, and is it that, you know, what has, what has changed about it since you came, what year did you come to, to the Pioneer Valley? I came to the Pioneer Valley about seven years ago. So that would have been about 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife grew up in Northampton, which is sort of the reason for coming to this area. So when I came here, the, Connecticut River line uh, was owned by Pan Am Railways. And the condition of that line was uh, pretty poor. The freight trains that ran on the line were basically limited to about 10 miles an hour. So it would take a freight train almost three hours to get from uh, the yard in uh, East Deerfield 
all the way down to the Connecticut state line to go down to Connecticut mm -hmm. or get to Springfield. <laughs> 10 miles an hour. Amazing. And, and so, so that was your immediate focus. Well, the, the, the interest at the time was that uh, there was a significant capital project underway to rebuild that rail corridor so that the Vermonter could be rerouted, so to speak. Um, instead of going north through Amherst, it would move on to its traditional route, which would run coming from the south, from Springfield to Holyoke to Northampton to Greenfield and on up into Vermont, rather than sort of the temporary route, which was to go Springfield over to Palmer and then up to uh, Amherst. So mm -hmm. we were very interested in, you know, once this train comes back to Northampton to Greenfield, how are people going to know about, about the train? <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, take the train. So we were, you know, I couldn't find a whole lot of information on the MassDOT website. And the Amtrak site was silent on the topic until the service actually began. Uh, so we, you know, of course, what we did is we created a website and started making information available to people so they could learn more about exactly what was going on with the rail service here in the region. Because you were concerned that if people didn't know about it, they wouldn't ride it. And then and then obviously people would say, well, you know, that that's a, a bomb. Because you mentioned, Ben, both um, Northampton and Amherst. And, and we should explain that what one of the things that is a sort of hub in in the Pioneer Valley is the five colleges. And that's obviously something that uh, is is very important in terms of thinking about the rail needs of the region. Yes, the, the, the five colleges, uh, which include Smith College, Holyoke, Hampshire, UMass Amherst, and Amherst College, uh, there are thousands of younger people uh, and faculty and staff uh, who need to move around between these colleges and, and get to other locations. And a lot of the transportation needs are met by the extensive uh, Pioneer Valley Transportation Authority bus network that operates between the five colleges. Um, but there's also a need for moving, you know, north and south along the rail corridor. So there's many people that, you know, will take the bus to Northampton uh, or vice versa to catch the train. And it, it was the north, the route north to south, this Connecticut River route, that was actually had been moved from one town to another at that particular. Um, uh, yes, the rail service was moved. The tracks, the train was rerouted. So when it left Springfield, instead of going east to get up to up to Amherst, it just went straight north uh -huh. in the direction towards Vermont. So just talk us mm -hmm. through the, the history of this. And actually, this is very helpful to me because even though you and I have worked together uh, and, and, and helped to work with others to found the Western Mass Rail Coalition, I don't know the Pioneer Valley very well. And I, uh, you know, there are some of, of the configuration issues and the issues of working with both um, Connecticut and Vermont that I don't understand and would like to understand better, especially as we think about the future. So the real push for expanding the service uh, in the Pioneer Valley came from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, which is based in Springfield, in particular Tim Brennan, um, who really drove an effort over many, many years uh, to do the, the necessary planning work and the prepare the studies and working with MassDOT um, to, to take the necessary steps as planners do with, uh, you know, bringing new services to fruition and putting them into place. Um, they received, uh, they, they filed a grant, I should say, um, grant request. Let me back up. I miss, messed that up. There was an application. I'm not thinking straight. Sorry. It's it's complicated to explain this stuff. So yeah, yeah. Under the Obama administration, administration, there was money available for uh, enhancing and expanding passenger intercity passenger rail services in the United States. And to make a long story short, uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, working with MassDOT, filed a grant application 
uh, for federal funds to reroute the Vermonter onto the Connecticut River line. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration made available $79 million to MassDOT to help fund the construction work necessary to make that happen. Now, the construction was just part, construction on the rail line was just part of the effort uh, to get the service moved over. The train plat uh, station platforms had to be built in Greenfield, Northampton, and Holyoke. Um, the, the arrangements had to be had to take place with Amtrak to, you know, do the back of the house reconfiguration work to, you know, add new stations and, and mm -hmm. launch the service. Um, you know, a new new signal system was developed and installed, or I should say, I should shouldn't say it that way. A new new signal system was designed and then installed. It completely replaced the signal system that had existed on the line, which may or may not have even been in service. At 10 miles an hour, you probably don't need much of a signal system. <laughs> and then as part of that also, there was a, a multi-decade effort underway in Springfield to redevelop the Springfield Union Station complex into an intermodal bus and train yeah, station. Right. And that, of course, right. was so led was... for many years, or it still is being led, by Congressman Richard Neal. Um, and, and where does that line uh, start and end? What, what is its destination? Can you help yeah. us? Where, where does the Vermonter go? So the Vermonter is a service that uh, is actually two trains that operate each day. One operates northbound and one runs southbound. The northbound train originates in Washington, D.C., comes up through Philadelphia, New York City, New Haven, Connecticut, and then it turns north and goes to Hartford and Springfield, up through the western Massachusetts, and then into Vermont, and then it stops short of the Canadian border um, in the, the town of St. Albans, which is just mm -hmm. north of uh, another town in Vermont known as Essex Junction. Okay, so it goes almost to Canada from, from Washington, oh, and then yeah. it goes back. Yeah, so, so and it's, one, it's one important train. that you use the words almost to Mm-hmm. Yes, there's 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 one train in each direction every day. And people use this train to travel between points on the line. Very few people step on the train uh in Northampton, as example, and go all the way through to Washington DC. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people who get on in Northampton go to places like Philadelphia, New Haven, uh, and primarily New York City, I should have said. That's the primary mm -hmm. destination of New York City. But there's people, you know, the, the beauty of this, this kind of a service is it's not an endpoint service, meaning people don't get on in St. Albans and go to Washington. There may be a couple, but primarily what goes on is people move between the points on the line. So you get yeah. people that get on in uh, White River Junction, Vermont, and they come down to Northampton, spend the night with a friend and take the train home. Or many people get on in Northampton in the morning and the, using the new Valley Flyer service, which is a different train service operated by Amtrak, which runs in the morning and they take the train to New York and then they come back the next day in the afternoon on the Vermonter. Mm -hmm. So it's just that when you have more than one train, you have situations where people can have obviously much more flexibility with their schedule. And obviously that is what we're, when, when we think about what people have in Europe or in Asia or in other other parts of the world. Um, that's what we're thinking of. It's not just a train going from A to B and B to A, but but making connections all over the place um, that you can change trains. And that's, I, I think we, we we should talk about how these these developments, you've become, you know, quite involved in advocacy for east-west rail between western massachusetts and boston as well so how does that all connect um in your mind and and actually on the ground so east east west rail is is a topic that people have been talking about uh you know many would say for a very long time there used to be service along this line it went away uh in the 1960s when uh rail service in the United States was in decline. Um, the rail corridor exists today. It's owned by a private company, CSX Transportation, um, as opposed to the 
Kinetic River Line, which is today owned by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Um, East-West Rail, like the Mass Pike, offers the ability or should or could offer the ability for people to move, uh, you know, along those tracks, along that quarter, uh, between points, uh, you know, obviously east and west of Springfield. People can get to Boston. People can, from Boston, can move to Albany. Not move to Albany, but take the train mm -hmm. to Albany. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. When you go to Springfield Union Station today, there's a ticket machine for the Hartford line uh, in the main concourse. And you can select on that ticket machine all the des destinations that are available um, on the Hartford line, including the destinations past New Haven to New York City on the New Haven line. Hmm. And one of the destination buttons on there, it says Yankee Stadium. So it's interesting <laughs> that in Springfield, Great. you can get to Yankee Stadium, but you can't get to Fenway. Now, why is that? <laughs> That's it, that should be our campaign slogan, Ben. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You said it. You can get to Yankee <laughs> Stadium and you can't w get to Fenway. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Um, so, so the service now. I, I I think we'll not focus on what's happened during the pandemic because that is almost a, a story in and of itself, but apart from the pandemic, where where do things stand now with service within the Pioneer Valley? So at the moment, um, the, the Pioneer, Pioneer Valley has three different services today. One is the daily Vermonter service, which runs once a day, north and south. Uh, there's also an additional service called the Valley Flyer, which started, uh, I guess, about two years ago now. Um, it's in a pilot phase. It's basically two trains down to New Haven to connect for onward travel in the morning and two trains north up through the valley from New Haven in the, in the late evening. Um, and then the third service is, a, is an Amtrak service um, called the Lakeshore Limited, which is a historic name, uh, which runs through Springfield east and west. Uh, it's, it actually is the existing east-west service that we have as we speak. Yes. Um, so you actually can get on the train in Springfield and go to Boston once a day or get on the train in Boston and go to Springfield, or not to Pittsfield, of course, once a day. That Lakeshore Limited service actually goes all the way to Chicago. And what what do you see as, I, I suppose we're waiting to see the results of the Valley Flyer pilot, which obviously we hope will be considered successful and that will continue. Um, what what would be other things that you'd like to see done given, you know, given time and money? If we look at the Valley Flyer pilot for just a second, mm -hmm. um, what's important, of course, is ridership. And how do you get ridership? Uh, ridership is driven by, you know, the ability to, frankly, access the station, meaning park. Uh, you need fares that are, are equitable and reasonable. And you need trains that run on schedules that people want to use them. The Valley Flyer is, is which is a pilot service at the moment, is limited in the sense that it, it only runs south in the morning and north in the evening. So, and it mm -hmm. was designed primarily for people to get to New York City and then return from New York City as the sort of primary focus. And you can do service. that to commute? Uh, I would not use the word commute. You can <laughs> do that. It's, it's a very long day to yeah. do that. It's basically, it's, it's about a four hour trip to New York City and four hours back. And that oh. is a long time to spend sitting on a train or in a car, even if you were to drive it in one day. Um, yeah. It's a long amount of time. And what we think is happening is most people who are using the Valley, Valley Flyer are going south, say on a Monday, and then they're coming back a day or two or three or whatever later either yeah. on the Valley Flyer, which comes in the late evening, or they come back in the Vermonter, or vice versa. I see. And where but, does but the, the Valley the other, Flyer end? You know, for the va for, it, for the va it stops sooner. It, it stops in Massachusetts, right? Yes. The, the Valley Flyer in the morning originates in Greenfield. Yeah. So it, comes, it starts in Greenfield, comes to Northampton, Holyoke, Springfield, and then it makes 
the stops along the Hartford line all the way to New Haven, Connecticut. But the interesting thing about, one of the interesting things about the Valley Flyer is not to get off into the weeds of uh, fares and pricing, the, the fares on the Valley Flyer are set at intercity rates, where which are different than the fares on the Hartford line. So the, Hartford, the, the Valley Flyer train, which originates in Greenfield, you pay a stepped up fare, basically three times the price uh, of using the Valley Flyer. But stop, I don't, I don't want to get into this. this mm-hmm. I changed my mind here. It's, okay. I, to try to get into this weeds of fares is, is too much, I think, for this interview. Okay. So, Ben, where are we with East-West Rail? So much talk about this over the last couple of years, but even, I'm not entirely clear where we are. As, as most people are aware, many people are aware, MassDOT's completed a very extensive restudy of East-West Rail. I use the word restudy because there was another study that was completed back in 2016, which came up with a plan for doing East-West Rail that was sort of put on the shelf. And then they, a few years ago, MassDOT sort of restudied the issue. And so they've completed their latest East-West Rail study. And at the moment, we're sort of waiting for some additional study work to take place relative to, you know, if there was an East-West Rail service, how would the governance structure be set up? Meaning, you know, who would manage the service? Who would who would operate the service? Who would, you know, take care of customer service and marketing and things like this? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but we're also waiting to see what's going to happen with the federal infrastructure bill. It, mm-hmm. It's very clear that for East West Rail to move forward, uh, Governor Baker has said, you know, we need to have, find answers to, you know, where's the money going to come from? The mm-hmm. East West Rail study that MassDOT prepared says that the project is in the three to five billion dollar range to do. And, you know, at this point, uh, the state funds aren't there to do that. So they're looking really for the federal infrastructure bill to provide the, the early steps in a multi-year effort, uh, you know, to potentially build out East-West Rail mm-hmm. uh, as a, as at this stage. Yeah. And there are a number of things that seem to be in play. At first, we were told that there was no interest in Boston uh, looking beyond the Massachusetts border to the west, to Albany. But that seems not, you know, we're now hearing talk about uh, about having the service go on to Albany, which is obviously a ra- the rational thing to do because it's a state capital with 90,000 people. Yeah. What's interesting now with East West Rail, what's even more interesting now is there's another layer on top of the East West Rail study that was prepared by MassDOT. Amtrak has come out with their own plan um, for creating new rich rail corridors in the United States. And in that plan, they've identified uh, a rail corridor between uh, Boston, Springfield, Pittsfield, and Albany that they want to add service to. Um, And if the infrastructure bill gets through, you know, I think a lot of people expect that Amtrak's going to be knocking on a lot of doors around the country, DOTs, Department of Transportation's doors, saying we are interested in operating the service. We think there's a market there. Can we work with you to make this happen? And it's unclear at the moment if Amtrak has yet knocked on the doors of the Massachusetts DOT and the New York State DOT to say we're interested in doing the service and what the reception might have been. Um, but this this is coming depending on what happens with the infrastructure bill. So yeah. there's there's sort of a a growing push to try to see if we can break what some might call a log jam here to, you know, try to get this thing moving. So there could be additional service besides the Lakeshore Limited uh, operating east and west across the Commonwealth. By, by Amtrak. And what's exciting to me about this, you know, to, when I hear about things like that is I think about all the connections because I, there's a lot of Amtrak service to Albany to places west and north. And at Pittsfield, we have, we're working to get the Housatonic line revived. So that's a connector point. Springfield is a very significant 
connector point, Worcester and, and Boston too. I mean, from Boston, you can take a train to Maine. So these are all, you know, creating a system or network like <laughs> the, the, the networks that used to exist. The, yeah. the other thing I wanted to, to ask you about is your work with the Rail Passengers Association and, and really your, your efforts with, um, you know, the, looking at the larger picture uh, um, in the United States. I know your focus has been local, but it seems to me that, especially looking at the Trains in the Valley website and seeing all that you've written about the importance of transparency, because obviously government is very much um, in charge of transportation. But there are a lot of advocates like us, as well as town officials and legislators who are interested in these things. So, and then there's Amtrak. Um, for listeners outside the United States, that probably a lot of Americans wonder what is Amtrak? Um, so can you talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, you know, about why you consider transparency so important and how that applies to some of the, 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 the big picture issues? Ben, one of the things I noticed on the Trains in the Valley website when I was looking it over yeah. yesterday is that you've put a lot of stress on the importance of transparency. Uh, and I would love for you to explain where that um, focus came from and explain how, why, why you think it's so important when it comes to infrastructure projects. The, the short answer is it's really tough to advocate for something when you don't know what's going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have access to information, you can't make decisions, you can't sort of guide, you, you need information to guide your thinking and to, and to effectively advocate for, for a cause or the cause or whatever project you're working on. And one of the things I've for many years been frustrated by is that Amtrak, which is, you can argue one way or the other is, Part of the federal government, not part of the federal government, um, and there's legal arguments going both ways. Um, you know, one simple thing is if you look at all Amtrak vehicles uh, on the road, you'll see they all have U.S. government license plates. So hmm. that would suggest to many people that they're part of the U.S. government, but they will argue that they're not part of the U.S. government, uh, and they, you know, there's merits in their arguments, of course. But one of the areas I've been really interested in is the fact that. There's a there's a board of directors at Amtrak that includes a, you know, they're appointed by the president of the United States, and this board of directors meets in private. There's there's no public in secret. In, in well, secret's another way to say it, yes, <laughs> but they they meet behind closed doors. So there's there's generally speaking no ability for anybody to find out uh, what is what the deliberations are of the board, what decisions they they've taken. And I've been sort of interested in this issue for a number of years. So I, I started filing what are known as Freedom of Information Act requests to ask for information about the board. You just can't ask for information. You have to ask for specific items. So I would ask, can you please send me the agenda and the board meeting minutes for a particular month in a particular year? And they provided that to me. They came back redacted, meaning they... They crossed out things that, you know, were commercially secret or shouldn't be known, I guess. Um, and then I collected a number of these and then I started to research the topic even more. And I decided this information needs to be made available to the public. So I started putting this on a dedicated page on the Trains of the Valley site as, if you will, a public service to make the information to anybody who wants to know more about the Amtrak Board of Directors. It's amazing to me that the Amtrak board doesn't see the need to do this for themselves, considering every other transportation authority, call it the New York MTA, the Boston MBTA, you know, bus up the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority, whoever, they have public board meetings. They're open to the public and you can read the minutes. You can attend, but not Amtrak. So whatever information I could find, I put on the Internet, on the Trains the Valley site, and all you have to do is search on Amtrak Board of Directors, and you'll find the site because there is nothing on the Amtrak site about the Board of Directors except for a list of people who are on the board. 
It's quite extraordinary because in the infrastructure bill, there are many, I don't know what's the percentage of that total bill that's going to go to Amtrak, but it's substantial. It's a huge amount of money. Um, the, the idea that the public would be providing these funds for good reason, but not have any access to the decisions that about, you know, that are, are guiding how it's going to be spent um, is extraordinary. So, so that, I, I think that's a, 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 a truly important service. Um, and I like to think that it's being done in Western Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> seems, seems fitting somehow. Well, it, it's interesting that the infrastructure bill in its many pages does include some uh, enhancements to the way the Amtrak board operates. And not to go into all of the details mm -hmm. of, the, of the wording mm -hmm. changes in the statute for the Amtrak board, but assuming the infrastructure bill goes through, through, one of the things that will change is the Amtrak board will be required to hold one, at least one meeting a year that is open to the public and to seek public input into what they're doing. How uh, how interesting. Well, that's that's good. I don't know if that's due to your efforts, Ben, but I have, I have no idea. <laughs> certainly very much in line with them. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a very positive thing. Well, there's a lot, of course, to look forward to. Um, I will I, I will ask because this is closer to home. Um, is transparency an issue for us with our state DOTs and other entities? I would say at some level, transparency is an issue. Uh, a lot to find out exactly what's going on within the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. There is, of course, information on the website, but it's generally quite limited. And, you know, as example, you know, when a, when a, when a big highway project takes place, there is a requirement to hold open meetings to seek public input. And that's because the federal, federal regulations require that if you're going to use federal dollars on the project, you need to seek public input into, into the work of the project. Discussions take place generally behind closed doors. We don't know a lot of what's going on. So in Vermont, they have something called the Vermont Rail Council, which by statute, which was created by the governor in Vermont about 15 years ago. And it's a group of people like a board of directors, but they're an advisory committee that meets once a quarter in public um, with the public present to discuss both freight and passenger rail issues in the state of Vermont. Down in Connecticut, they have a group called the Connecticut Commuter Council, I think they're called, which focuses on the commuter rail services that are operated in the state of Connecticut. We don't, at least out here in Western Mass, have any sort of body where uh, MassDOT, led by MassDOT as example, that comes together from time to time to discuss what's going on with services, both freight and passenger, if you will, um, and what could be improved. It just seems the only avenue to getting, uh, working with the DOT is through elected officials. And I think that's a little unfortunate, but yeah. sort of that's what it is here. Because there are many stakeholders, and rather than being, um, you know, adversarial, I think that, in fact, that that advocates and and others, including the business community, could be much, could actually be very helpful. So I think that's something that we should all be working towards: is having better avenues of communication, especially if there's going to be. Um, money to spend um, creating new climate resilient, more equitable, you know, efficient transport systems in, in the region. Uh, well, thank you very much for this conversation, Ben, and um, perhaps we'll, we'll pick it up um, when we're a bit further down the, the road, uh, further down the track. Sounds great, but happy to talk to you, Karen. Support for Train Time is provided by the Transportation for Massachusetts Coalition, which includes more than 100 organizations advocating for clean, equitable, smart transportation solutions. From sidewalks and bike lanes to intercity rail, 
T for MA is leading the conversation on how we can build a truly modern transportation system. Learn more at t4ma.org. Thanks for joining us today. The Train Time podcast is brought to you by the Train Campaign, sharing a vision for passenger rail as the essential framework for efficient, sustainable transportation in the 21st century. Learn more at traincampaign.org.